Howdy, welcome to the Maze Mastercast. I'm your host, Ben Wiggins, and it is a beautiful day in Aggie Land. We welcome Julie and Susan to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Ben. We're excited to be here. Yeah, I'm very excited. Let's start at the beginning. How did you two meet? First meeting, it was, it was 20 years ago. So Susan was the executive director of the Women's Business Enterprise Alliance, and mm-hmm. I was the owner of a marketing agency, Keystone Resources, mm-hmm. and I was looking to get a certification because someone had told me that that was a good way to grow your business. I didn't really know a whole lot about it. Um, it turns out the Women's Business Enterprise Alliance ended up becoming a, a client of ours, um, and we ended up growing our business through getting that certification and a bunch of other government contracts and was able to successfully sell that business five years ago. That's great. The Women's Business Enterprise Alliance became a client of yours. What did that relationship look like? What were you doing for them? The organization put on an expo each year. It was our biggest event of the year, our biggest fundraiser. And so we actually worked with Keystone Resources to design all the graphics, the program book, everything. So we spent a lot of time at the Keystone office uh, putting everything together, spending a lot of time playing with a sheepdog. <laughs> Yeah, and, and planning, and it was great because once the sponsorships were sold and the ads were sold, we were able to coordinate directly with the large corporations such as Shell and United and BP and and all the other ones, as well as other women-owned businesses that were either having uh, booths or ads. So we were really able to gain exposure for our company as well as pick up additional businesses and really understand what that woman's entrepreneurial ecosystem look like in, in Houston and, and leverage those relationships. And then what made you decide to partner up in a more formal way? Um, I kind of bounced around a little bit, did some more nonprofit. Then Keystone Resources actually reached out to me. So Julie said, hey, you know, you want to come do some business development for us. So I, I worked for Julie. Yeah. And then after that, when she sold the, the company, I reached out to her and said, hey, I have an opportunity for us, and let's go. And so we actually met a client here in the College Station area okay. and said, let's, let's start working together. And that was the start of B2G Victory? Or what, what, what happened from there? So B2G Victory formally started in January of 2022. Okay. So we're we're still very much in the startup phase, about six seven months old. Yeah. And so I was it was during my sabbatical, and interesting enough, it was a woman owned engineering firm based in East Texas and here in Bryan College Station area, who had attended one of my seminars three years prior, had kept a hold of the handouts from the session and the business card, and and had Susan's contact information and mine as well when my email didn't work because I had sold. She reached out to Susan, and Susan's like, we've got to get to work. I'm like, well, I'm still enjoying. She's like, no, 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 you're you're, you're going back (laughs) to to work. Time Time to to go. go. And so I had my, you know, consulting company, and she had her consulting company. So for about Mm. two years, we each had our own respective company sending invoices back and forth. I would work on some of her clients. She would work on some of mine. And um, when I started my executive MBA program at Mays in the fall of 2020, this was the reason why I was going back is to build a scalable business to focus on helping companies win government contracts and in turn helping the government agencies hit their small women, minority, and veteran-owned goals. Mm -hmm. So in the grand scheme and grand plan of things, B2G wasn't supposed to launch until I was done Mm -hmm. with with grad school, but uh, the market, the demand, and just how everything happens in life, um, we launched formally in January of 2022. Okay. Well, and congratulations to you both. Thank you. When you exited your previous business, what was the impetus for that? Um, what did what was going really well, and that told you it might be time to exit, and what might have not been going so well that told you it might be time to exit? So we were in a really interesting phase in in our business growth model. We were at the point where we were doing really well in in a certain size space of of marketing agencies. And in in order to take the next space, we were really going to need to to get some serious capital or go out for investors. Mm -hmm. And that just really wasn't where my heart was. And Mm -hmm. interesting enough, in tandem, the proposal division of of the company, so we had traditional marketing, traditional interactive, and the proposal division. Mm -hmm. And what we were finding out is that division was the most profitable 
and that was the division that was actually generating the work for the other two divisions. So mm. we did on average a million dollars worth of revenue as a marketing agency, specifically on government contracts. Right. And so it was like, wait, wait a minute. And I was starting to speak more on government contracting and sharing how we were building our business through government contracts, as well as helping other businesses secure government contracts. And that's really where my passion lended itself to. And thinking about, okay, how, how do we scale this? Well, I can't be at every speaking engagement everywhere. I can't be doing um, five proposals at the same time. Um, and, and how do we train people? How do we leverage our experience? And how do we build this into a sustainable business model that doesn't burn everyone out? <laughs> sure. Now, you said that's where your passion was. Can I ask why? Because if you hear like gov the government contract space, you know, that's kind of, it, there's, it's, it's an odd place for, for, the, the, for the thing that <laughs> for really like that. the flame that burns bright, like the government contracting space. Why? Why is that? So I think, you know, Susan can provide some really good examples of, of why we're so passionate about what we do. So she's got some great examples. Yeah. So growing small businesses has always been a passion of mine. So I worked with the, you know, Fortune 500 companies. You have to be invited to do business with them. Yeah. Uh, government contracting is very transparent. It's very open. Anyone can submit on a government contract. You have to go find them. You submit them. And to me, it was just like, it was that wow moment. It's just like, oh, so anyone can do this. If you think you have the capacity, submit. It's more um, democratic. Yeah. So, and it, it's just, and then getting those calls from those small businesses. Uh, we had a... Um, catering company, Nooskis. And Chef Yo called and she said, hey, I just won a five-year contract with San Jacinto College. That makes, gets you excited. It is, it is a very gratifying um, to know that you help them do that. Yeah. Is there something to working with businesses that are women-owned, minority-owned, to a large degree with marginalized classes? That is that is that part of the is that part of the mix for the two of you? Yeah, and I think our our overall company vision, you know, aligns with with Maze's vision, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and our vision is to do meaningful work. However, that has a meaning, right? So, a meaning for social and economic impact, um, you know, which aligns with you know. Um, advancing the world's prosperity. And back to what Susan said, a lot of businesses are very intimidated by it. It seems mm -hmm. very frustrating. It can be fatiguing, but there are so many more advantages actually for these marginalized groups, these small women, minority and veteran owned businesses in mm -hmm. this space now more than ever. Mm -hmm. And if I was able to do it and figure it out, it's been really gratifying to help other companies grow mm -hmm. and figure it out as well. We have another construction company client who was primarily focused in residential. So within the last two years, we've been able to pivot him and have residential be like only 20% of his business, government contracting be 80% of his business. Wow. He is doing revenue, twice as much revenue as he did last year, already this year. He has two more crews and, and he's able to go to a bank now and get capital because he has these government contracts. When I mm. sold, I was able to get a one and a half times higher multiple because I had these long-term government contracts, which allow businesses, like I said, to have access to capital, allow them mm -hmm. to, to not have the stress of, am I going to get paid? Is, is the client you know, going to renew? Do I have, how am I going to staff accordingly? A lot of that, when, when you have a government contract, you're able to plan mm -hmm. a whole lot better, not only for cash flow, uh, but for resources as well. Hmm. Now, B2G Victory, what does is, what is the day-to-day -day operation look like? So typically we have anywhere between three to four proposals in, in production right now. We have one uh, for the Texas TxDOT. Mm -hmm. We have one for Fort Benning for a transportation client. We have one for an Illinois tollway proposal for a veteran-owned client um, okay. up in the Midwest. We have another catering um, proposal for, for new skis. And so we've got you know, various proposals going on and then speaking engagements. So we do quite a bit of speaking engagements and videos from our previous speaking engagements are posted on our YouTube channel, B2G Victory. So if small businesses aren't able to come to those seminars, 
during the day or, or at night, then we want to make sure that they have access to information. And so that goes back to that scalable part of the business model is we want to make sure that we're supporting our clientele throughout, whether it's Saturday at two o'clock or, you know, <laughs> more like 2 a.m. <laughs> two, or, or 2 a.m. On, on, on a Thursday, because that's how entrepreneurship you know, works. We're also um, in the process of behind the scenes getting ready to launch our membership portal. So we've got lots of undercurrent things, busy, busy, um, getting other tools, resources, and templates available to help our clients grow and be successful in, in government contracting. And we have one person on our team that specializes in just helping clients get their certifications. So she is constantly cranking out certifications and gathering, helping them gather their documents, um, because it can be in a very intimidating process. They have all of these lists of documents and, you know, what, what are they supposed to mean? So she works with them hand on hand to get everything ready. And then she helps them submit their application and just kind of walks and keeps track of it. So, you know, we're working on proposals. She's working on certifications. We just have a lot going on. The whole process of, you know, responding to RFPs and so forth feels very stern. How do you make it feel a little friendlier because the system on its own could not feel less friendly. <laughs> <laughs> um, breaking it down into to small pieces for them. This is the section we're going to work on, and we just break it down into very, very small chunks for them. Yeah, and a lot of follow up. A lot of a lot, a of, lot follow of follow up. up. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's hand holding. Some of it is right. So we have clients who have been doing proposals for ten or fifteen years, and we have. Clients, um, we just landed a soccer company who does soccer equipment out of California, mm -hmm. um, and he's never done any of it. And so from start all the way to finish, we manage that, that entire process. We read it, we interview, we really try to take a lot of the heavy lifting off of the clients because they're capable, they have the capacity, they have the experience. It's just, where do I fill out the forms? What do I need to do? How do I put this all together? So we really customize that entire experience, depending on what their budget is. And then of course, what is the schedule? So we ver reverse everything out, find out what they have in terms of historic information. If it's nothing, then we start from scratch. So often we'll find a proposal and we don't just send it over. We send it over with what we call a go, no go. So basically help them to understand <clears throat> if it's going to be a good fit yeah, or what some of the challenges might be. Sure. Um, so they know we're always looking out for them and we'll we'll tell them this is you know it's this if they send us one we'll look through it this is not going to be a good fit and this is why we're not just going to take your money we're going to make sure that you have a very strong chance to win and that it is the best fit for your company right so i had one that um was looking for security so she sent me over a proposal and i said you know what this is the money you're going to have to pay out before you even get started with the contract. Look on page such and such. And we went through it. And she's yeah. like, I, I didn't realize that. I said, I can't afford to get this one even started. I'm like, well, this one's not a good fit. We'll keep looking. There's always an opportunity out there. We just need to make sure it's the right opportunity. Yeah. And back to the transparency of why, why we get so fired up about this is, yeah. you know, small minority and women and veteran owned businesses actually have an advantage in this space because it's transparent, right? So you can mm -hmm. see who's the incumbent, you can get a copy of, of the proposal that they submitted, you can get a copy of their pricing mm -hmm. and when you do an open records request. So now you're going in eyes wide open. Can I be competitive? Where am I, my current pricing in terms of the pricing um, that this current contract is, you yeah. know, am I going to make money? Is, does this make sense with what profit margins I'm expecting to make that can help sustain my business? And if it's not a good fit, it's not a good fit. It's, it's not a good fit and it's not worth it. If the process being transparent gives, um, women owned businesses, minority owned businesses, veteran owned businesses, small businesses, a better chance to compete. Why do you think Fortune 500 companies whose bottom lines theoretically depending, depend on finding the optimum process, right? Why are they still doing things in sort of the, you know, it sounds from what you said earlier, like they're still doing things in kind of like the back, the boardroom handshake type of way. That, that seems like it would be an inefficiency. 
So why are things still being done that way by large private, large publicly held companies? companies? A, a lot of them. And, you know, there are a lot of companies who are doing really, really good things in, yeah. in the DEI space, the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And right. so there's there's a group called the Billion Dollar Roundtable. Right. Um, Dell is one of them. United Airlines is one of them. And what this is, is this is a group of corporations that are committed and have historically been committed. Pepsi is one of them as well. Hmm. Um, to spending a billion dollars with women, minority, and veteran-owned businesses. Hmm. So they have a commitment, just like government contracting has goals. They also have goals mm -hmm. and, and initiatives that, that they want to meet and, and are very active pursuing and working with these businesses to help with innovation, to help with the challenges in supply chain, for example, right now, and helping diversify the spend. And so the spend looks like the communities of which they're in, the spend looks like their employees, and the spend looks overall and, and inclusive. Okay. And we, you know, we did just win um, the catering company a contract with a large corporation. Oh, that's great. Uh, because it, you know, it was it was basically the same process. Once she found out about it, they, you know, they called her said, "Hey, we want you to bid on this." Um, so there is opportunity with Fortune 500 companies. It's just they're easier to find with the government. Hmm. So Susan, you strike me as the one who keeps it light. Julie's probably more like me, a little bit straight ahead, pretty intense. Um, so what's it? Tell me, tell me a funny story about Julie. Oh, there are so many. <laughs> <laughs> Julie and I have been working together on and off for many years and trying to put together um, the just all of the graphics and all the things that go with Expo. I mean, we had. It, we had fun with it. It was just, a, you know, just, it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. And so just one of the things is like, oh, it's expo time. I'll be, I'll be hanging out at the Keystone office. Y'all see me there. <laughs> um, and just all of the, the high energy that she brings and the excitement that her team had and her, her, and it's really not funny, but her commitment to the small businesses is just an amazing thing to see. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to the other end of the spectrum. What were the vulnerable moments where you felt like you didn't necessarily have the answers? What, what has that looked like for you too in your, in your business careers? When I got laid off. Yeah. So, you know, we all graduate and we have this plan, right? You know, when we graduate, I got my undergrad from Sam Houston and, you know, you have this plan. And my plan was, you know, to graduate. And I was very fortunate. My first job out of college was at Disney World. I was in Disney event productions. Uh -huh. And I did PowerPoint and teleprompter for, for large meetings and, and corporate meetings. And that was a lot of fun. And so I thought, you know, okay, then I'm going to be in corporate America. Then I'm going to get married. And then, you know, have the kids, the picket fence, and then do entrepreneurship. Sure. Well, life said, hey, I think we're going to throw a little bit something at you. And um, so I ended up coming back to Texas uh, because my brother, Chris, had cancer. Mm. And um, he's in remission and, and we're t truly, truly blessed. But, you know, it's funny how you think the way that your life is going to go. But I ended up getting everything that I ever wanted. So I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. I got laid off shortly after 9-11. Couldn't find a job anywhere to save my life and started doing speaking engagements and started doing presentations and then it just grew and grew. And so I didn't know what I was doing, right? So the first five years of my previous business, I didn't have a business plan. It was a wing and a prayer and a 20 pound laptop and we were just gonna figure it out. And it did obviously work out, but there were definitely scary points where it was like, but this was the plan. Mm -hmm. But you just have to sometimes just be open to, okay, what am I supposed to be seeing here? What is what, I'm, what am I supposed to be learning? Maybe sometimes it's patience because I'm not a very patient person. That's how Susan and I balance each other <laughs> yeah. out a little bit. She's a morning person. I'm an evening person. So sometimes when she, in the mornings when we work together, I haven't had a cup of coffee and she's already been working <laughs> for three hours. And I'm just like, wait a minute, I just hit snooze. Um, yes. Give me a minute. But, you know, I think it's, it's the yin and the yang and how we balance each other out. Um, but just, you know, figuring it out. And I think also, you know, back to not always having the answer, but just surround yourself with people who do. And I think that is more true than ever um, now yeah. than anything. My, I guess my biggest, um, like, oh, no, what am I going to do is I also got laid off. And actually, from the WBEA, I guess kind of a funny story is Julie was on the board at the time. <laughs> We're still friends. <laughs> um, and just, you know, I... 
was working, you know, trying to take care of my mom who had dementia and Parkinson's and mm. didn't have a job and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I had been with the organization for 14 years and worked my way up all the way from answering the phones and taking reservations for events to being the executive director. So it was just like, like frozen. I, I didn't know what to do. And so just connecting with Julie again and saying, okay, you know, let's, let's do something together. And she introduced me to the government contracting space. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was hooked. It's like, this is something that we're, you know, I'm going to do. So when she sold the company, I'm like, wait a minute, we're not done yet. So we yeah. were able to continue that relationship and, and make things happen for small businesses. That's fantastic. Let's do a plug for the mothership. How, how has Mays contributed to the mission and the vision of B2G Victory? I'll let Julie take that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, when I did my final interview at, at Mays in 2020, and I left the interview with Julie and Julie Orzabal and Jordan Sash, Sass, sorry. Shout out to Julie. Shout out to Julie or Orzabal and, and Jordan the Sass. The whole Orzabal family as well. That's right. Um, and they said, you know, do you have any other questions for us? I said, I actually do. What do I need to do um, while I'm waiting for an answer from y'all? Mm -hmm. And they're like, no one's ever asked us that that way. And um, they they gave me a list of things. And in, in listening to the Mays Mastercast mm -hmm. was actually mm -hmm. one of those things in the list. And so <laughs> this is very near and dear to me because it, it literally goes – you know, full circle. And as I went through um, my EMBA program, you know, there are various courses and, and, and emphasis. And as I was going through the curriculum, we were actually building B2G Victory. So there was information in case studies and chapter readings and such and exercises in Excel that we were able to apply specifically and immediately to building our company. Um, Dr. Chambers worked a lot with me with my capstone project, which was the entrepreneurial track, which was this. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Laura Lee Hughes was my advisor who, within I think my third meeting of her, told me about the Entrepreneur Veterans Boot Camp. And you know, we were speakers for that last December and just, you know, earlier so this month. We were we were presenters as well, and you talk about getting you know fired lit up to to be able to give back sure. to to veterans. You know, my dad was in the Air Force. Susan's dad was in the Air Force. So to really have that that personal personal connection and to see their energy and their excitement, uh, you just feed off of it. I mean, you can't help but not do that. I mean, you you volunteer with that as well. Yes, yes, it's. Um well, I don't know what I can really add to that other than to say I'm really thankful for all of the structure that Mays and McFerrin put around us in terms mm -hmm. of especially, I think it's especially helpful. You kind of alluded to this, Julie. Once you know where you want to go, and I think one of the big disservices that we do to, that we as a business culture do to young professionals is encouraging them, pushing them, I would even say, to find their stride too soon. I think we really need to find a way as a business culture to be gentler to our really talented young people and say, don't have the answers yet and be comfortable in the not knowing. But I just had that discussion with my oldest granddaughter. Oh. Um, she is she's dynamite. She is into everything, but she's, she doesn't really want to know, doesn't know what she wants to do. She's She'll be a junior in high school. So, well, you know, I want to go to college, but I don't know what for. I'm like, you don't have to have all the answers to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, I said, and, and what you want to do when you grow up is going to change many times. I didn't figure out what I wanted to do when I grew, grew up until I was after 55. So <laughs> <laughs> it's going to change. It's going to, you know, and that's okay. Just find something you love to do. Study that, but also know that if later on you don't, want to do that anymore that's okay too yeah. and you can find something new you love to do but you don't have to have the answers at 17. yes and the follow your passion advice i think is particularly fraught because it implies that you have to have a passion now at age 15 17 21 that's going to carry you through the entire your the rest of your career mm -hmm. julia you, you had something yeah absolutely and it goes back to to our vision of, is doing meaningful work 
And so we had an intern last summer um, mm-hmm. helping us at helping us out. And so she graduated from the University of Iowa, Bella Scribbage, whose dad I met through the EMBA program. Yeah. And so now Bella is back and she's a full time employee. Oh, fantastic. And so she's exploring, right? And and figuring out. And and we're very candid. You know, is what I love Bella to be with us for five, 10, 20 years. That would be just a delight. But let's be realistic, right? And so I think a lot of businesses are like, well, why would I even entertain an intern? Why would I even invest in someone when they're only going to be here for a year or two? Well, you know what? But what if you don't and they stay? And what if you do and then they go back or, or they leave and they come back? And, and the skills that you teach them that they can use in a different career, in a different skill set. You know, our whole life is, is very much kind of like a helix, right? Because what you learn exactly. mm-hmm. it, when you were 18 or 21 or, or 28 or 38 or 40, what have you, you know, 55, 55 <laughs> um, you're going to use later on in, in your career. And I also think, you know, encouraging everyone, regardless of your age, to explore things and new, learn new things, you may end up using it. And and you're, you're not aware of it at the time. And interns also teach you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes. And well, and they, they can become partners later. Mm-hmm. Like the, mm-hmm. you, you talked about sort of the, the helix of life, which I love that phrase. Um, but there's also the business can be approached from a place of closedness or a place of openness. And so I appreciate the, the approach that you two both take. So this brings us to current. Let's talk about Aggie Pitch. Let's talk about Raymond Ideas Challenge. And let's talk about what's next for B2G Victory. Sure. So we, back to, back to the EMBA program and really leveraging everything, being a full-time student at, at Mays, was able to enter B2G Victory in, in the Raymond Idea Challenge. And we ended up becoming an honorable mention. So we got a really big golf check for that, which nice. was a lot of fun <laughs> in November. Then um, the timing worked perfect when my capstone project and, and the, the deliverable was coming to a conclusion in Aggie Pitch, mm-hmm. really being able to, to leverage going through that process as well as helping get the capstone over the finish line and also our business plan, right? So everything really worked in tandem and was so synergistic. We entered in that and um, were an elevator pitch finalist. So that was really interesting to go in front of people like rapid fire um 60 seconds no visuals straight from memory go and of course i was the first one out the gate uh, because they went in alphabetical order and so that that was great experience for us when we go to pitch your investors when we go to pitch at a bank um and and that feedback right from the aggie ecosystem has has been truly truly wonderful and as you could probably tell, the whole 60-second thing was a challenge for Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been for me, too. <laughs> so where do we go from here? What's the... Our next thing is, is, is actually launching this portal. This membership portal is going to allow us to really expand um, our client base, really expand the opportunities for these small businesses because they will have immediate access. It was any time. Any time access. Any time to access to our videos as well as templates tools so they are able to kind of do why you know do it yourself Mm -hmm. um, but they also will have access to us to provide additional information so they can schedule a 30-minute call with us we'll go over anything that they don't understand Mm -hmm. and it's going to be a community so we're going to have you know frequently asked questions and answers there'll be a glossary there as well there'll be templates so for example one of the tools you use in this space, whether it's government or corporations, and you want to do work with them as a capability statement, right? That's kind of your one pager um, company right. resume. So you can go to the membership portal and do a search for capability statement. So there'll be a one minute video, there'll be the hour long video, there will be various capability statement templates, there will be the explanation of the various acronyms that are used on creating a capability statement, there's going to be an online chat. So like Susan said, it's, it's this anytime solution, also a scalable part of our business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that so working? that if we're not available or budget constraints, or let's say, you know, you're, you're, you're growing your business and now you want to train someone else to do it, you can do that. So we really are trying to, to be that solution for, for the, the one guy in the truck, the one gal in the kitchen, or, you know, the $10 million, 60 employee engineering firm. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. What about good bull? Good bull for anybody today? Oh gosh, there's lots of good bull. So <laughs> females that I'd like to 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 do shout outs for good bull is Sasha Crabtree. She's a fellow Aggie. I've known Sasha for 20 years. She has a company called Remote COO. And so mm-hmm. she helps with all of the operations behind the scenes system, uh, systems of a business. 
She's doing great things. Just wanted to support. And, and we're doing work with her as well. Mm-hmm. She's going to be managing our speaking engagements. And then I think, you know, there's another Aggie for Good Bull, which is uh, Kanika Lee uh, Jefferson. And she just recently got promoted. So she's with Port Houston. And Port Houston is one of these government agencies that have really are disrupting uh, the space. And so they have goals for small businesses as well as women and minority owned businesses. And so she's in the business equity division, which is a whole new division that the port has formed in mm-hmm. 2020. So they've been doing this for 30 years, but they, they really kind of doubled down in 2020. And um, Kanika is, is an Aggie and she's a part of the business equity department at Port Houston, just changing lives and making a huge impact in Harris and the eight contiguous counties. Oh, we're always working with with the port, and so Kanika has been a big part of making sure that um, all these small businesses are included and have real opportunities. All right. Well, good bull to them and good bull to the two of you. Thank you so much for the time today. Thanks. Really enjoyed Thanks. the conversation.